In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are becoming excited about Jody's ordination, which will be held on June 22nd during the closing session of the California and Nevada Annual Conference at the Convention Center in Sacramento. She has asked me to be among those, along with the bishop, who will lay on hands an ancient ceremony. Jody will be ordained a deacon, an act which recognizes her call to ministry. Every member of the church is a minister. All Christians are Christ's ministers. But the church sets some apart to be ordained to special forms of leadership and, uh, and ministry. A while ago, Judy, uh, Jody gave me a t-shirt which reads, I'm proud to be a United Methodist minister. Then in the fine print down here, we also ordain men. <laughs> Not all denominations ordain women. Some churches don't allow women to serve on uh, their church boards and councils. During the last boy's chrysalis, a high school boy handed him this question. Why do you have women pastors when scripture forbids it? He was not being obnoxious. He was quite sincere. He goes to a church which preaches against the ordination of, uh, of women. On Easter, we had visitors from out of town who were quite intrigued with Pastor Jody because uh, they go to a church which aggressively forbids women to be pastors or leaders. So what about women pastors? This Sunday, which is Heritage Sunday, let's look at scripture and tradition. There are two passages most often quoted by opponents of women in ministry. The first is 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35. Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. It is shameful. Oh, you like that? For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. The second passage is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silence. Pretty strong language. And it is very clear with not much room for argument. However, these verses are not the only words in the Bible, nor are they the final words on the subject. When you read and study the Bible, never take a passage as God's final word. Never take a passage as God's final word until you apply two tests. The consistency test and the historical test. First, the consistency test. Check the passage's consistency with the message of the entire Bible. And especially test it against the, our understanding of what Jesus said and did. Jesus is the focus of the Bible. Jesus is our final authority. So check the consistency. <laughs> the second important test is the historical test. What is the historical context in which this passage is written? To whom is the passage written? And what was going on at that time that caused this passage to be written? And, as, have 
there been historical developments inspired by the Holy Spirit? Historical developments. The Holy Spirit did not go on vacation or into retirement after the Bible was written. For example, if the Holy Spirit had stopped inspiring, there would still be slavery in the world today. And is there anyone today who would support the institution of slavery? Yet slavery was an accepted fact of life, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. And in the last century, prior to the Civil War, slaveholders quoted the Bible and supported their position. Abolitionists also quoted the Bible in support of their position. And thank God, their position prevailed. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, I believe. If there had been no historical development, for example, Women today would have to go through a complicated procedure to be uh, ritually cleansed following their monthly menstruation cycle. We also would not be eating pork, and children could be put to death for sassing their parents. I didn't hear any reaction to that one. <laughs> And uh, when someone starts quoting Leviticus to you, beware, because Jesus reinterpreted Leviticus. Jesus was not a literalist. Jesus believed in historical development and in the continuing inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's apply the historical test to the Corinthian passage. Scholars believe Paul wrote the Corinthian passage where he told women to keep silent in church and ask questions at home. Now, what was happening in the Corinthian church that caused him to give this advice? And what was the historical context? Paul's main theme in his Corinthian letters is to call the Corinthian church back to order. The Corinthian church was in chaos. It was a shambles. People speaking in tongues were disrupting the worship service. People were getting drunk at communion. People were taking communion by themselves. And evidently, some women were contributing to the chaos by interrupting the service with questions. Now, perhaps because it was such a new phenomenon for women to be included in the worship service, they just got carried away. They were filled with questions. They were enthusiastic. They were curious. And Paul told them to keep quiet, ask the questions at home, so the worship service could proceed in an orderly manner. The Timothy passage, where women are forbidden to teach or to have authority over a man, does not pass the consistency test. The passage is not consistent with how Jesus treated women. Jesus included women on his ministry team. Women accompanied Jesus on his travels, Luke 8, 1 to 3. Jesus talked to women, even foreign women, like the, like the Samaritan woman. The Timothy passage is also not consistent with the Old Testament, where Women were leaders of tribes, and where some women were prophets, they were preachers in the Old Testament. Nor is the passage consistent with Paul. Paul recruited women pastors. In Acts 9.36, Tabitha is called a disciple, a disciple, a woman. In Romans 16, Paul sends greetings. 29 people, 10 of whom are women. And he begins by sending his greetings to Phoebe, who was a deacon. A deacon. Some of the Bible translations translated as helper, translated by men. 
But the Greek word is deacon. She was a minister in the church. Paul then reads Prissa and Aquila, naming the wife first. Paul Prissa had accompanied Paul on one of his missionary journeys, and in Acts 18, 24 to 26, she instructed a man, thus contradicting the Timothy, the Timothy passage. Nor is the Timothy passage consistent with Paul. In Galatians 3.28, where Paul wrote, There is no longer male and female, for you are all one. One in Christ Jesus. Well, the Timothy passage does not pass the consistency test, nor the historical test. The Timothy passage is not a historical development but a historical reversion, backing up. Timothy was probably not written by Paul because uh, it had a, it's at a much later date. It talks about bishops and elders and, and a church organizational structure that was not yet formed in those early days of Paul and Peter. The writing is from a later time when the prudes and the prunes were saving the church from what they thought were excesses of Jesus and Paul. They thought Jesus and Paul had gone too far. The men who ran the churches in the second century. So they, we see them turning the clock back in order to keep women in submission. And this historical reversion went so far that they even outlawed women to sing in church. Could not sing. You go to England today, and the cathedrals have men and boys quiet. The only recourse left for women was to develop their own movements, their own orders, their own convents, so they could serve God. Until the Holy Spirit began to move in the Protestant church, including ours. In the mid-1800s, there was a great deal of controversy over women pastors within Methodism. Some were licensed, and some were even ordained, only to have their ordination revoked at a later, by a later conference. One such woman was uh, Anna Howard Shaw. She was questioned interminably, interminably about her call to the ministry. One man asked her, wives are to obey their husbands. Suppose your husband should refuse to allow you to preach. What then? <clears throat> she said, well, even if he did, it would not concern me, for I am a spinster. <laughs> <laughs> so the man asked, well, you might marry someday. And she said, well, possibly. And it is equally possible that I might marry a man who would command me to preach. And in that case, I want to be all ready to obey him. <laughs> Which leads me, this leads me to my final point. The most compelling argument of all that God wants some women to be pastors is that God obviously calls some women to be ordained, as God calls some men. Can any of us doubt the genuineness of Pastor Jody's call to ministry? She obviously has the gifts, the graces, competency, spirituality, motivation, and commitment to be ordained a deacon. Would anyone accuse God of being in error Get out of that one. <laughs> Jody is the seventh woman pastor with whom I have worked. She's number seven. Let me tell you about the first. It wasn't until 1956 that the Methodist Church finally ordained women 
A hundred years of controversy. Finally, in 1956, the doors were opened. Mary McNichol was one of the first women to be ordained. And she and I worked together from 1961 to 1966 in the central Minnesota Methodist Parish. There were 10 churches that cooperated with four pastors. Mary was pastor of three churches, and I had four. I was just out of seminary, so they gave me the most, of course. Mary wore two dresses. She might have owned more, kept changing them, but we, we only saw two. A black one for winter, and a white one with black designs for summer, both of whom hung well below her knees. She wore her hair in a bun, wire-rimmed glasses, and a little black hat that she only took off when she was conducting worship services. She carried a Bible under one arm and a Methodist discipline on the other, under the other, as she went forth to preach the gospel and to shape up those rural Minnesota congregations. She had a, she had a delightful sense of humor, wonderful woman, and a no-nonsense administrative style. No one wondered where Mary stood. We had, we had wonderful times of ministry together, and I learned a great deal from her. Especially, I learned a great deep respect for women pastors. Mary's mother lived with her. She was Mary's housekeeper and cook. And when Mary Sr. became ill, she moved back to Philadelphia. Mary Jr. and her sister decided that Mary Jr. should take a leave of absence from her ministry to go back to Philadelphia to uh, take care of her mother while her sister worked. <coughs> Not only could her sister earn more money than Mary could as a pastor, neither the sister nor the mother really took Mary's call to ministry seriously. Some women are not taken seriously. We visited them in Philadelphia, and we found that Mary Jr. had lost her fighter, her sparkle, her zest, her call, and soon after, she died. And the irony is she died before her mother did. And the doctor felt that the cancer which finally killed her had its inception from the time she left the ministry. Mary Jr. is an example of Jesus' warning in Luke 9.62 where Jesus says, No one puts a hand to the plow, and look, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Mary sacrificed her call and she lost her life. Truly, truly, Mary had been called by God to be a woman pastor. God calls every one of us to ministry, to some kind of ministry, and God gives us spiritual gifts in order to do the ministry. But in addition, in addition, God calls some to ordain ministry, both men and women. Do you believe that? What do you say when you believe it? Amen. 